um, what was it we saw? The Conjuring, I think, was what we saw when the first Getaway trailer was released. Yes. Honestly. Which, by the way, is really late. That should have been a sign. <laughs> I was never <laughs> able to put it on anything. Um, so, um, that trailer came... Well, I, had, I didn't know anything about the... I didn't see the trailer. I just knew the plot. I was like, well, Ethan Hawke is in this. I mean, I know Selena Gomez is in it, all right, but... Hey. Uh, Ethan Hawke is in it. This should be fine. Okay. Because uh, I was actually trying to think of a bad Ethan Hawke movie last night, and I was... I'm sure there's more than one, but off the top of my head, I couldn't think of one. But, um... I can now. <laughs> um, I, well, that trailer came on The Conjuring, and I was like, well, um... This could be awesome, but uh, this trailer's a little weird. <laughs> yeah, but, you know. All right, it it was t it was weird tonally, and just for, especially since it starts with the Dark Castle logo. The only thing missing like, was the Martinez score. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Um, isn't the isn't Dark Castle responsible for like a lot of the uh, early two thousands horror remakes? Yes, like the Haunting and Thirteen Ghosts and all those. Indeed. <laughs> um, I haven't seen that logo for a long time. No, there's a reason why. <laughs> Well, here it is again, and a non-horror movie. This isn't even remotely a horror movie. Nope. Despite the fact that um, I looked up the director. The director, uh, contrary to popular belief, is a guy, <laughs> but his name's Courtney. Courtney Solomon. Okay. And he is, this is his third movie. He is also the director of Dungeons and Dragons and American Haunting. Oh, boy. <laughs> American Haunting was actually okay. Um, I haven't seen it since the theater seven years ago, but I remember it being fine. <laughs> um, and Dungeons and Dragons has its reputation, obviously. Yeah. You'll notice that those movies are seven years apart. I think Dungeons and Dragons was 99, then American Haunting was, uh, 2006, and this is 2013. Wow. Um, and apparently he was a writer or a producer or something on Captivity. Which is one of the worst movies ever made, I think. That horror movie with uh, Alicia Cuthbert that tried to be hostile. Oh, God. Yeah, that one. <laughs> um, so things weren't looking good for this movie. And then, of course, that 0% on Rotten Tomatoes showed up and got a lot of negative word around. So by then, I was, you know, still keeping open mind because it's like, well, you know, it's a fucking Ethan Hawk. I blame him because... Yeah. <laughs> Because the whole time I was telling myself, Ethan Hawke's in it. Nothing can go wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially after having uh, The Purge of Before Midnight already this year. He was on a roll. <laughs> well, he had to fall sometime. Yeah. Well, okay. So, uh, it starts right away. I'll give it that. Yeah. It's Christmas. Christmas morning, I think. Yep. Yeah. And, um... We see, like, this black and white footage of, uh, the house has been broken into, and... Well, no, no, it, there's a whole bunch of shit going on. He comes home, the house is ransacked, and they're flashing back to when his... I don't know what... It was fucking Christmas. I don't know where he was, but... Yeah. <laughs> they never say that. Nope. Um, oh, no, he has that drama scene with Selena Gomez where he tells her everything. Maybe he said it in there, but I was spacing out, but I'm pretty sure he never specified what the fuck he was doing out and about on Christmas. It's not like it's the family man and he went to the store. But... <laughs> Could be looking for a Turbo Man doll. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everyone else does on Christmas. <laughs> I'm not the pervert. I was just looking for Turbo Man doll. <laughs> <laughs> Jiggle all the way. We'll have to come to Pop somewhere down the road. <laughs> <clears throat> so anyway, um... You know when I knew this movie was probably going to be bad? I know you I know you shouldn't jump the gun on movies immediately, but you know when I knew this movie was going to be bad? How's that? Um, well, we have this pretty... It's a pretty impressive opening sequence. Yeah. With the beginning credits and all that. Well, not the beginning credits, but... Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah, more or less. The introduction credits, we'll say. I gotcha. Um, and then... Uh, he stops, and then Voight gets the monologue about, you know, you have to do this and this and this, so I'm going to get it, and then, you know. You know, because John, every time John Voight does an accent in a movie, it goes over so well. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So, um, please do not, uh, mention any, uh, exceptions, because I don't care. It's like when, um, Roger Ebert did his review for The Pink Panther, and he said, uh, every time Kevin Klein 
has a mustache, he's going to have an accent. And then he put in parentheses, please do not mail me in exceptions. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, <clears throat> well, anyway, the point I was getting to, when I knew this movie was going to be bad was when um, the movie, co- okay, the best thing for a movie like this to do would have been to be nonstop. Correct. <sighs> That's not the case. It tried to be. We suddenly cut to... I don't know where they are. Actually, I don't know how this works. Um, the way they introduce it, are they? Are the, is everybody in this movie in Bulgaria? I think so. Hmm. Okay, because they're clearly in somewhere. They're clearly in a place that's foreign to them. Yes. Um, but it's. We've gone through the whole introduction before it says Bulgaria, so I didn't know if. And then they we see her amongst you know her little cell like where they kept Blake Lively and Savages. I reference Savages a lot now. You think it was a Tarantino movie? Yeah. <laughs> How many times I reference it? Um. And right away, it is so not necessary for us to see where she's being held. True. It's just because the movie. The movie as is is 90 minutes, and if we didn't pack some things in there, it wasn't going to make the feature length deadline. <laughs> I would said less than that, to be honest. Um, so the second I saw Bulgaria, and then they throw her into a cell, and you have these big muscle guys watching her, it's like, all right, um, it's going to try to be a bad version of Taken, apparently. <laughs> yeah. No, the... the um, the best thing for this movie to have done would have been to just... Okay, okay. they want to do the thing where they shroud Voight's face in mystery. Yeah. Which, by the way, the only reason for that is for a stupid, predictable twist at the end. Yep. Sorry if that was a spoiler to you, but... <laughs> that's, really. That's the only reason. Um, you said predictable twist. You did not say what it was. <laughs> they even put John Voight's name in the TV spots. Really? Yeah. I haven't seen a TV spot for it. The t- you know how the trailer said Ethan Oxelina Gomez? Yeah. The uh, TV spots say Ethan Oxelina Gomez, John Boyd, actually. <laughs> so. <laughs> Brilliant marketing. Um, <laughs> they got a, They have an Oscar winner in their movie. They might as well put him, you know. Doesn't say Star of Brats or Star of Baby Geniuses too, at least. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> okay, so um, it doesn't say Academy Award winner or anything either. Just like, it makes Selena Gomez feel bad. Academy Award nominee, Ethan Hawke, Academy Award winner, John Boyd. VMA winner Selena Gomez. <laughs> Give her some credit. <clears throat> anyway, um, yes, the best thing for this movie would have done was to have completely stayed on Ethan Hawke. Yeah. I'm going to be totally honest. Um, I don't hate her. I mean, she seems cool. You I come off like you do sometimes. She seems cool in real life. She was good in Spring Breakers. In Spring Breakers, she showed that she can probably, you know, be good. But, um... A big reason why this movie is bad is her character. <laughs> yeah. Like, if you took her out of it, they, well, they still would have had a lot of work to do, but if they had taken her out of it, that would have been a big fraction of the bad stuff happening. So it's kind of mm-hmm. like Parker with Jennifer Lopez. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, it also kind of gave me a vibe of, um, there's this movie not many people really know about, probably because it sucks. It's called Shattered. Which is not to be confused with the Tom Berenger Bob Austin series from 1991. This is a movie starring Gerard Butler and Pierce Brosnan. Where that Pierce, sounds like a great casting right there. Pierce Brosnan basically does the same thing with Gerard Butler. Okay. Um, but that movie blows. Oh, God. Pretty much on the same level as this one, I'd say. Um, so we have... We see John Boyd. We see the back of his head. And we see, like, from the side... They keep teasing his face, even though we know what fucking John Voight looks like. He's like Dr. Claw. <laughs> John Voight is Dr. Claw in this movie. And he's at this Christmas party, right in plain sight of many, many people. And um, here's the thing. I mean, I know, like, okay, maybe, you know, everybody, he's, he's speaking English. Yeah. Maybe everybody around him doesn't speak English. Possibly. Regardless, somebody has to notice... Um, as soon as Selena Gomez gets in the car, like we see in the trailer, and he says, uh, kill her, kill her now, you would think 
somebody would at least get some kind of vibe from a guy sitting his computer and bra and right right in the open in this Christmas party screaming, "Kill her!" <laughs> Maybe he's playing like a role playing game on his uh, iMac. <laughs> and here's the thing. Okay, so they want us to think that John Voight is this big ruthless villain. Uh, and they tell us that by making Selena Gomez call him asshole every time they do some kind of act of revenge towards him or something. Cause yeah. Whatever. But I anyway, was waiting for her F-bomb and it never came. But regardless, uh, what makes John Voight so evil? He says, I'm going to kill your wife unless you, I'm quoting here, now drive. Smash into as many things as you can. <laughs> That's his big evil plan. It's like a video game. Yeah, it was like a really lazy video game. <laughs> the programmers just kind of like checked out like 15 minutes into development and they're like, okay, we're just going to throw this together. And now you have Getaway. Drive onto the ice rink. No, there's people there. <laughs> Crash into things. Knock things over. Yes, let's, let, let's make him drive into the ice rink where he may slide off and crash into something. But apparently this car is indestructible. It's like Stuntman Mike's it's vehicle. It's death proof. <laughs> it is death proof. <laughs> the car, not the, it's not mimicking death proof. No. Um, so yes, then Selena Gomez comes in, and, uh, oh, we think she's this hooligan carjacker, but oh, nope, it's her car, because she's an affected rich girl. <laughs> um, was that a spoiler? Probably not. This is not, <laughs> this is not the chase. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what's going on Neglected here. rich girl? <laughs> Christy Swanson on the one. Without, thankfully, without the love story, at least. Yeah, it could have been there. <laughs> um, regardless, um, it was a platonic. Yes, it was. We'll go with that. Um, so anyway, and so he has to drive around with her, but of course, you know, she's this she's this hip teenage girl. So he goes, what, in her 20s now? Yeah. I think. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, she has to be this hip teenage girl that's all tech savvy and uses, you know, hip terminology. And, oh, and then, you know. She was written by Juno Temple. Like, she, she played by Juno Temple, written by Diablo Cody. Juno McGuff, you mean? Yes. <laughs> And, you know, she's, you, you know... saw where I was going with that, so you're good. She's the wise-cracking sidekick, you know, and that's... Oh, my God. The girl with attitude cliché. She's Penny. I already said John Voight's Dr. Claw. That <laughs> makes Ethan Hawke Inspector Gadget. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love to see that movie. I would, do. <laughs> Absolutely. Somebody make that a fake trailer. A dark, gritty Inspector Gadget starring Ethan Hawke. <laughs> Hey, there's a lot of scenes. Well, you just mentioned that, too, and I was like, wow, this really is like Inspector Gadget. <laughs> okay, so, um... So we have all these cliches, and then we go into, um... This movie has a lot of those, um... A lot of those moments where you can basically, um... Somebody, like, John Voight will start to say a line, or Selena Gomez will start to say a line, and you're able to complete the line in your head before they finish it. Yep. Like, um, specifically, it happens so many times, I was trying to remember some of them, but the only one I can remember off the top of my head right now is when, uh, complete it for me, just so I can prove my point. Oh god, I don't think I can. Ethan Hawke says, um, do I know you? And John Voight says, no. No. But I know you. But I know you, <laughs> yeah. Damn. Yeah, so Ethan Hawke is this um, uh, former race car driver. And we do... You wonder through the whole movie if we're going to get a motive from John Voight. Um, at the very end... Very end. And... Trust me, it's not worth it, people. I promise you it's not worth it. <laughs> Just leave now. I don't even... I'm going to be honest with you. I don't even remember what it was. <laughs> I just remember going, wow, that's really pointless. I believe it was something to the gist this of... It's kind, of, kind of a spoiler about myself, man. Fuck it. <laughs> he wanted to uh, he wanted to make him realize his potential. Something like that. That's pretty much... That's not verbatim, but that's basically the gist of it. I'd also like to point out something annoying about Selena Gomez. Her character, I mean. Thank you. Um, okay. The, this was so annoying. I don't know what this... Okay. So, what happens here is, um, so he goes, gets in the car, and she thinks Ethan Hawke is doing all this. She thinks he's the psycho. She's, she thinks he's the one that put the cameras on the car, and who the fuck would do that? I don't know. Don't know, unless you have a YouTube channel. But regardless, she thinks everything is his fault. Alright. <clears throat> okay. 
But then the movie progresses, and she realizes it's not Ethan Hawke, it's John Voight. And John Voight, she knows all of this now. She knows that John Voight has his wife, and he's going to kill her unless Ethan Hawke does all this stuff. We're an hour into the movie. All of this has been established. They've yes. even had their sob stories to each other where they confess everything to each other and they're like, oh, this is why I'm sad and this is why my life sucks. She's like, oh, well, this is why I'm sad and this is why my life sucks. And they're like, oh, man, our lives suck together. I understand you and I understand you. An hour into the movie, we're going back into action sequences and she starts blaming Hawk again <laughs> for all of this. This is all your fault. I hate... How many times does she say, I hate you to him? At least 17. 18, after after times. she was under the full understanding that this is not his fault and he's in just as much danger as she is. Oh. John Voight's 12 rounds. <laughs> yes, and let's talk about the fact that um, Voight appears to be this so-called brilliant genius because he's devised all of this already. Everything that happens in the movie is supposedly predetermined by him. All right? He predetermined, he stole the car, mm -hmm. her car. He predetermined that he was going to make sure Hawk stole that car. Then he made sure that she, he pretended to be a cop and he called her and told her where the car was. And then she came. And then, of course, he was going to use her because the whole plot basically goes into, she's the daughter of this bank CEO. Yep. And they're going to rob that guy's bank. So all of this was predetermined. He figured all of this out in a very elaborate scheme before the movie started. Why did he not know that her character... He knows everything else about her. Why did he not know that she was this tech-savvy person that could most likely outsmart him? <laughs> People just don't think sometimes. Especially writers. No. Um, and they reused the old... Um, you mentioned speed. Yeah. Before we went into the movie. And sure enough, uh, towards the end of the movie, they act always the cameras are in the car. Yeah. And they use the exact same ruse in Speed, where they take the security cameras and they loop them so he doesn't think they're going anywhere. That exact moment in Speed, copied and pasted right into this movie. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, yeah. Um, I'd also like to mention that... Um, Never before has such a non-stop action movie been so redundant. And yeah. the, this guy cannot handle action scenes at all. <laughs> no. And uh, like I said, that opening was fine. And then, there's also a good, a well-done scene where um, um, Ethan Hawke's in his car and he's chasing the car that Sunny goes has been taken by this point and she's being driven off and he's following her and we see it from his car's perspective, the whole chase, all the way up till they get to a, uh, a roadblock. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a pretty well done shot. Not bad. Um, but we have these, uh, throughout the whole movie, it's basically cars crashing. It said, um, I read somewhere that there were 130 cars that were crashed while making this movie. So much so that they had, the movie had its own, it's own junkyard, junkyard on the set. Yeah, I remember reading that. Um, every car in this movie is a police car, and every car in this movie is the weight of a feather. Yeah. Because Ethan Hawke is in this indestructible machine. It's just a normal car, by the way. Yes. <laughs> and he can just bust through anything. You hit a police car. You just hit the front of a police car. That fucking thing will fly into midair. <laughs> when is in it Shelby another, Cobra after all? <laughs> in like the Fast and the Furious movies, they can get away with this over-the-top thing. Yeah. But the thing about Getaway is it's trying to be serious. Yeah doesn't work in that environment. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Um, so yeah, you've got uh, you've got 12 rounds in here, you've got drive in there, you've got taken in there. Speed. Speed, yes. Spectre gadget. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna keep bringing that the, up. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. The, um, it's just for training to go go gadget crack pipe. <laughs> yes. John Boyd's final <clears throat> reveal, he looks like Father Marin from The Exorcist. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, let me bring this up. Um, if you remember, if you gave a shit enough to watch the verses with Sean Dead Hot Fuzz, I mentioned the actor Paul Freeman. Who yeah. Played, uh, he's the priest in Hot Fuzz, and he's uh, Ivan Ooze. Yes. Um, <laughs> if, you, um, if you know what Paul Freeman looks like, this movie's twist is no surprise to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd feel insulted if I were him. It's like... the. So the makers of this movie assume that nobody knows what I look like. That's nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, we also get Bruce Payne. Bruce Payne is an awesome actor. Who's I haven't seen him in a shitload of movies, but every time I see him, he's he's awesome. 
he's got this presence about him that's really memorable. He's mainly known as the he was the villain in Passenger Fifty Seven. He was also in Dungeons and Dragons and makes sense. Um, an old movie with Kevin Bacon and Gary Sedgwick called Pirates, where they um, they basically get sexually aroused when they set things on fire. It's a it's a quirky romantic comedy. He, he he was like the friend part. It's it's a very interesting movie. <laughs> Sounds like it. Um, but he's there basically doing an impression of Peter Stormare, and he's there for like five minutes. Peter Stormare and The Last Stand specifically. Yeah. <laughs> um, did I miss anything? Yeah, this this would have been a uh, well, a lot of things needed to be done to this movie to make it work. But something that really needed to happen was it needed to not cut other things. Yeah. It needed to be very uh, like what Speed did. Yeah. We only pretty much the only time we're out of the bus is the very few times we cut to uh, Dennis Hopper. Has to be frenetic pacing. Yeah. And this just... There's too many times where we're stopped, and when the action is happening, it's not interesting, and it's redundant, and... No. No. <laughs> this, this movie doesn't work. Nope. You want to add anything? I, uh... I wasn't sure. I saw the trailer, and I like Selena Gomez. I do. You know, I'm a... I love... I, I don't care. I love Wizards of Waverly Place. I don't have a problem with saying that. And I loved her in Spring Breakers this year. It's still my number two movie of the year as of right now. I may have to change things before the year's over, but at least it is right at this moment. Um, Ethan Hawke, uh, I love The Purge. I really like, really enjoyed The Purge for what it was. Then again, I really wish it could have been something a little bit more. Like, they could have done a lot better with it. But it was good, and I do enjoy his work The Purge is like a masterpiece now compared to the... <laughs> yes, it does. So, the thing about it is, is going in, I wasn't sure. And you told me about the uh, Rotten Tomatoes scores, and I was like, eh, they're just marks. They may not know anything. And then I was like, wait a minute. I'm half asleep anyway. I've been working all day. This is not going to bode well for my enjoyment of this film. And it just didn't. Yeah, it, you went to sleep for about 20 minutes. Yeah, and I don't think I missed anything. <laughs> More police cars flying like they weigh five pounds. <laughs> if I saw another vehicle, like, crash, I was going to go insane. So, yeah, it was kind of like, by the time the movie was over, it's like, let's get out of here. So I got a video to shoot. So that was the end of that one. Yeah, just not good. Not a good movie at all. Uh, Straight-to-DVD movie that somehow got a theatrical release because Ethan Hawke was in it. It feels really ill-fitting. When here, It tried to be Die Hard at the very end. How Let It Snow is the end credits song yep. to Die Hard. The end credits song to get away is fucking Jingle Bell Rock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When really the only reference to Christmas is the very beginning. Very beginning. It snows for like a second. Yep. And then stops immediately. And every now and then they'll drive by a building that's like Christmas decorated, but... No. <laughs> that's it. So many better movies uh, <clears throat> pulled this off a lot more convincingly. We just mentioned most of them, so... <laughs> go watch those. <laughs> Don't pay money to go see this movie. <laughs> I just realized... Something came to mind literally just now that I wasn't thinking about last night. Okay. Um, this is a spo This is probably a spoiler, but you don't, it doesn't matter by now. This movie has the exact same ending as Phone Booth. Yeah, it does. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Very true. Almost exactly. <laughs> yeah. Alright. I'm done talking about this movie. Yeah, we've been talking about this for like 23 minutes. <laughs> All right, let's go on to uh, the Bling Ring. I okay. guess it came out in June, I think. Actually, do, 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 do. we're two months late, <laughs> but here it is finally. It was June. You're correct. Um, I'm really not much into Sofia Coppola. No, I mean, you're not. Well, uh, well, all right. Um, she has what? This is her fifth movie now. I believe so. Um, but the Virgin Suicides, yes. which was, it's fine, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, that's good. That was her okay. debut. That was definitely not as, you know, artsy as she's gotten. Uh, then there was Lost in Translation. Yes. Um, which is, it's a movie that, I mean, a lot of people fall in love with it instantly. For me, it grew on me. Um, but then she did Marie Antoinette. It's got its followers, but not my thing, I guess I should say. Nope. Oh, God. And then she did Somewhere. 
Was there something in between there? Nope. I've got her time. It's five movies. You're right. All right. Um, I already, I've, in a couple videos, I've expressed what I think is somewhere, so we'll leave that at that. Um, this was very interesting. I mean, I know she's, um, even though a lot of her movies are really boring, when I say a lot, I mean Marie Antoinette and fucking somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> out of five movies, uh, two out of three. <laughs> So I was very surprised at how lively this movie felt. Yeah. The opening scene is sleigh bells playing very loud <laughs> to a very lively montage of um, basically rich people things. Yes. Because um, sleigh bells is the happening thing right now. They're like in the painting game trailer. and um, they The song that's in this movie, they performed live at the, at the, the bar scene in Premium Rush. Yeah. Um... But yeah, they're actually, um, for a modern band, modern bands aren't really my thing anymore, but, uh, these guys got it going on. <laughs> right on. <laughs> That's, that sounded so fun. <laughs> these guys have got it going on. <laughs> so regardless, it's like when, um, Will Smith imitates white people in the Freshman of Bel <laughs> Very nice. <clears throat> so, um, there were, um, a lot of activity in this movie for a Sofia Coppola movie. Most definitely. <laughs> um, as pretty much everybody knows by now, it's the true story of the teenagers that rob celebrities' houses. Correct. Uh, that's pretty much it. But uh, Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Sofia Coppola movies are known for their fucking simplicity of anything, so... Yeah. Well, uh, I make it sound like I hate her, but I liked um, three out of five of her movies. Yeah. So, <laughs> I should. I suppose I shouldn't hate her so much. It's just how badly uh, Marie Antoinette and somewhere really bring those other three down. <laughs> True. <clears throat> okay, so um, see, my notes on these are really sloppy and all over the place. So I got to figure out where I'm starting here. Um. The, well, the very first scene after the opening scene is Emma Watson talking to the camera. She's talking to an interviewer. Mm. I think we circle back around. I think it's her right before she's about to walk into court. I, I believe so. Correctly. Either that before she walked into court or after she came back. Yeah, we usually we usually see movies a lot closer to these. We saw this like a week ago, so i got to really reach back into my head to remember it. Um, and her voice killed me. <laughs> she really had the... Um, obviously, she's Emma Watson. She has that... She's got, you know, the British accent and yes. all that. And she sounds, you know, sophisticated when she talks. Um, I found it very interesting how much she nailed the uh, stereotypical dumbass teenager voice, basically. Yeah. <laughs> very true. <clears throat> um, as a lot of people pointed out, this is basically uh, a cleaner version of Spring Breakers. Spring Breakers without the sex, basically. And yeah. the nudity. Um, a real vibe I got from this movie is something, I don't know how many people have seen it. It's an older movie. I think it's from, like, the early 80s or something. It's a movie with Jodie Foster called Foxes. Okay. With, um, oh, God, there's another famous woman in it with her, and I'm drawing a blank on who it was. Oh, shit. But anyway, it's a similar thing. It's the, um, it's a group of girls that are basically, you know, coming of age and getting into trouble and all that. It's kind of... I don't remember much about Foxes, but for some reason, watching the bling read made me think back to it, so they must be... There's, there must be some singularities in there somewhere that I'm... My subconscious remembers that I don't. <laughs> um, they also go into the cast really fast. Um, there was a lot of... Uh, there's only, like, three people in this movie I recognize. Most of them are, like, I guess new. Yeah. I recognized Emma Watson, obviously, and Vera Farmiga's sister. I don't know how to pronounce her first name. She was on American Horror Story, and she was in, uh... She played the younger version of Vera Farmiga in Higher Ground, I think. There was a, um... I've got it here, but I'm trying to see how to pronounce it. Leslie Mann plays one of their moms. I can't... I've never... I couldn't tell who. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> um... But regardless, and um, a lot of things that was talked about uh, before this movie came out was obviously with the Virgin Suicides and Marie Antoinette and all that. Sophia Coppola has that connection with Kirsten Dunst. Correct. And a lot of there was a lot of circulation about Kirsten Dunst being in this movie, but nobody really knew for sure. 
Kirsten Dunst is in this movie, and you know this if you saw the trailer. They spot Kirsten Dunst at a bar, and she's just standing there for one frame. Like, just one, just there, and then she, they say, oh, there's Kirsten, and there she is, and then she's gone. <laughs> yep. Um, so, uh, you're going to have to run down the rest of the cast, because I do not know those people. Okay, that's <laughs> fine. Um, I will talk about the first uh, character is Mark. He is the uh, the quiet teenager character. The guy who's um the guy whose sexuality is very very unsubtly ambiguous. <laughs> he his claim to fame, um his name is Israel Brassard, and he was in Wow, this this hurts even talking about this movie. And not personally, this just hurts because it's a bad movie. He was in the chaperone. What's that again? Or the Triple H movie. <laughs> oh chaperone God. and he also did a movie called Flipped oh yeah that the Rob Reiner movie. film I didn't see it but I know with uh, Rebecca DeMornay uh, John Mahoney Penelope, Penelope Ann Miller Miller Aiden Quinn and Anthony Edwards um yeah he was in the chaperone that makes him <laughs> void of all meaning um <laughs> sorry sir he basically um was it when they were at Paris' house that he stole the high heels yes and he like wears them around his room correct they never say that he's gay. Never. Never, never once. That, they never say that he's gay or boy. Nope. He just is what he is, and the movie lets it go. He, it's kind of funny, because he, um, he reminds me of, uh, what's his name? Kevin. In Perks. Ezra Miller? He definitely reminds me of Ezra Miller in Perks. <laughs> He's got that same gear. He's got that same gimmick too, basically. Oh yeah, I should probably mention this real fast. Um, apparently, this has gone down as, believe it or not, the first movie that Emma Watson is in that's not based on a book. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if My Book of Marilyn was, or if they're just not counting that. I have no idea. I think they mean starring role, more or less. That sounds right. Even though she's not really heavily. Uh, I mean, she's heavily in the trailer, but she's not like the main focus. That other girl is. Yeah, uh, we'll talk about her actually. That's Katie Chang. Uh, she's Rebecca Ann, and she is. Her background is a little bit different as well. She is. Trying to see if there's anything on here. Well, apparently this is her first film, and her second film is going to be a 2013 movie that I have not heard of yet called The Birder's Guide to Everything which is apparently a, a Rob Meyer movie with Cody Smith McPhee and Ben Kingsley. Sorry, Sir Ben Kingsley. I'm a sir. He's a legitimate sir, so there you go. <laughs> well, to, make it, to make it sound like I'm I know what I'm talking about again, I will mention somebody else that showed up in this that I recognized. Okay. They're in a very small part at the end. I was like, holy shit, is that him? Yeah, I know who you're going with, too. Uh, do you? You're going with Gavin Ross, though, aren't you? No. Really? Surprised you didn't know that. Uh, Marshall M Bell. Is the uh, cop that interrogates them. Marshall Bell is uh, Quato in Total Recall, the original. He is not even <laughs> listed in this cast list. And he's also um, for you fan for you people who are not fans of Total Recall, he's the villain in Twins. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> dear Lord. So there you go. He's in a lot of stuff, and he pops up like everywhere. And so when I saw him, I was like, "Holy shit, is that fucking Marshall Bell?" <laughs> and it was. I watched. I watched the credits, and there he was. Um, also in this movie, of course, is, we talk, we already talked about Emma Watson, she's, she's Nikki Moore. Uh, Claire Julian is, uh, Chloe Tainer, and she... Yeah, a couple of those girls I started, I, I was Is the daughter to... of Wally Pfister. Yeah, so I remember hearing about that. Um, yeah, a couple of these girls I started getting confused, and I couldn't tell them hard, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um... Regardless, uh, have you figured out how to pronounce uh, Miss Farmiga's name yet? I think it's Tysa. <laughs> I am not sure. I, like I said, or I Tysa. Tysa sounds right, and uh, she's Samantha. She's well, uh, Samantha Moore. It's funny because that's another I character. Don't, in I don't. I don't know what's more insulting. I say I don't want to insult actors by trying to pronounce their names and saying it wrong, or if I just say I'm not trying to pronounce that at all. I don't know what's more insulting. Yeah, get me, get me to uh, be thrown under the bus here. Uh, Leslie Mann, you've already mentioned as well. Um, there are, like I said, I wanted to bring up uh, Gavin Rossdale. 
You know who Gavin Rossdale was, correct? The lead singer of Bush, uh, Mr. Gwen Stefani. I know his name. He's uh he's actually Ricky in the movie. So yeah, he's in there as well. Mark Coppola's in the movie as well. And uh of course the cameos of Paris Paris Hilton is definitely in the movie. Uh Kirsten Dunst, which you've already they shot, mentioned. They shot the they actually shot the scene in Par- of Paris's house in Paris's house. Yeah. Uh Lindsay Lohan, of course, in archival footage, uh Audrina Patridge and who is pretty much the person the uh done the party on the entire group because she's the reason that they got yeah, we'll caught get, in the first place. Yeah, we'll get to that. Rachel Bilson, Miranda Kerr, and Orlando mm-hmm. Bloom. I also wanted to bring up, um, what was up with the names in this movie? If I recall correctly, nobody got a last name. And I don't think they're using the real names of the people. I think they are changed. Uh, they're actually in parentheses on here. But here's the thing. is, What was really weird, I've never seen I'm not a Facebook user. If I was, I'd fucking kill myself. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> but I have noticed, I do know one thing about Facebook, and that is, Facebook looks really weird in this movie because not a single fucking person in the world has a last name on Facebook in the bling ring. <laughs> they are all just their first name. <laughs> is that common at all? You have to have a last name on Facebook. Okay, so what was up with that? Because... <laughs> Did they not want to go through the trouble of giving these... Fake names, fake last names. They've got fake last names. They're listed on this cast list, but they just weren't mentioned in the movie. <laughs> apparently, um, all the characters, like legitimate names, like of the people of the real story, are in parentheses on this uh, page as well. So I know all their names too. All right, now I want to bring something up about Paris. Um, it had me interested because I actually wrote this down before I knew that they shot it in Paris's house. Okay. Um. Apparently, Paris allowed this. Yes. Surely she had to have allowed people to film a movie in her house. <laughs> of course. Um, this movie does not make her look good. No, not really. <laughs> um, when I saw the movie, I assumed the um, the Paris pillows, all the mirrors in the house, all the pictures of Paris throughout the house. It was all work. Um, were those not added for the movie? I highly doubt it. To be totally <laughs> honest, I highly doubt it. And there's the funny thing where they find fucking... Tinkerbell? Pictures in the closet. Oh, yeah. They, What is that on her? <laughs> um, which, oddly enough, becomes one of the pieces of incriminating evidence later. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, the people in this movie are very dumb. Yes. But, like I said, I can't really blame that on Sofia Coppola because this is how it really went down. The people in real life were this dumb. <laughs> it's like pain and game. Yes. <laughs> um, so, Adrena Patridge posts that security footage Correct. on the news. Yes. But the girls feel that they're so invinci- This doing this makes them feel so invincible that after the security footage of them is on the news, they go and they rob Rachel Bilson's house anyway. Yep. <laughs> um... But there is a um, a very interesting, uh, it's an interesting long shot. It's one shot that's from a distance when they rob Adrena Patrick's house. That's an awesome scene. Yeah, where we're like... They keep turning the lights on and off. and It's like a, um, I'm trying to think of another example, but it's... Um, all the, like, all the windows are, like, really big glass windows, so you can see pretty much everything inside. Yeah. So you see them, like... You see the whole thing go down from a really far away shot. Correct. <laughs> And it's interesting. Um, now, having given Sofia Coppola a lot of credit on this movie, it sounds like I've been doing a lot of bashing over, but for me, it's been a lot of... Uh, what I've been saying about her is actually compliments. Okay. <laughs> she still can't help herself sometimes. Much like in Getaway, she realized that uh, her movie was very short, so she had to stretch it out a little bit. Mm-hmm. There are a couple of scenes that are a little way too long. There are slow-mo shots of them dancing in clubs. Yeah. Dancing in clubs wasn't going on enough, so they had to slow it down into slow-mo. Slow-mo dancing in clubs. There's one shot where one of the girls looks at themselves in the mirror for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's true life, though. It was, that was also a slow-mo shot, I think. Yeah, it was, actually. Um, and it's like, Coppola, you're doing fine. Could you, she just can't help herself. She has to be artsy from time to time. This is the woman that made Somewhere, though. So... <clears throat> All right. Um, yeah, to add to their stupidity, they also go around and fucking show off what they steal. 
So they post selfies on Facebook of, of them at with these, the money. Yeah, <laughs> with money and at Paris's house and everything. But yeah, it's actually um, it's fine. It's kind of like bully. How you only took it only took telling one the wrong person to get them all found out. Once again, uh, much like Spring Bre- we're talking about Spring Breakers, this is a much cleaner version of these other movies. It's still rated R, it still has, you know, drug use and language, but... And that's it. Yeah. Um, I'd like to point out that um, I'd say um, Emma Watson is probably the best of the cast, mm-hmm. but I also really... She's barely there, but I love Leslie Mann. Yeah. Especially the scene with... Um, she has this giant poster board that she's made of pictures of Angelina Jolie. <laughs> yeah. She thinks she's the most she's, modern role model. She's homeschooling them. Yes. And she's trying to give them reasons as to why, uh... She asks them for reasons why they love Angelina Jolie, and the answers are, like, her husband and her uncle. <laughs> it was just funny the way she presented that poster board so proudly. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was hilarious. She's so oblivious. <laughs> Indeed. But I, uh, I think Leslie Mann's very underrated. A lot of people, a lot of people don't like her because they think the only reason she's in movies is because Judd Apatow puts her in movies. I really like her, and I think she's got a lot of talent that people don't really, people tend to overlook. Not to mention she's incredibly good looking. <laughs> so um, that's pretty much that. It's, it's on the, it's on the level of the. There's no Sofia Coppola movie that I love. Mm. And I, I would say there's probably not going to be. That but one. um I, I I could be jumping the gun. She could make a masterpiece at some point. Mm. It, in my eyes. A lot of people, you know. There's she has her followers that think everything she does is a masterpiece. Yeah. Including Marie Antoinette, which I think you'd have to be fucking on something to think that, but that's what people think, so there's that. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to uh, the bling ring before we I liked it. I liked it a lot, actually. I, I thought it was funny. I thought it was well done. Uh, it's one of those... It's kind of like how Alpha Dog plays out, where uh, you change the names of everyone. Like, obviously, Jesse James Hollywood is not his name in the movie. <laughs> and, I mean, if you remember the whole story of, like... I mean, I vaguely remember hearing about this a long time ago. And it was, like, interesting that they were going to make a movie based on it. And I heard about it. I was like, okay, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> And I thought, I enjoyed it for what it was. I thought the cast worked really well. Um, uh, full disclosure, I think the, the main girls are really cute. But that's just me. <laughs> main girl or girls? Well, well, Katie Chang, and uh, I think she's really cute. That's just me. So. <laughs> but uh, yeah, she was really good, and she's very convincing in her character. I mean, I think everybody was very likable and unlikable at the same time, and I enjoyed that. You mentioned not liking the soundtrack because of... But that's the thing is, uh, you have... I hate Nicki Minaj, to say the, to well, here's say the, here's the least. The, here's the thing. A lot of a lot of tools <laughs> like the music that is in this movie, but it's a movie about tools. <laughs> so there's yeah. that. It's a movie about people that you know, are the stupid people that People look at it and say, oh my god, this is the future. Let's all kill ourselves now. So, it's interesting to have to have a perspective on it from that. From that. Yeah, it's <laughs> very true. Alright. Oh god. <laughs> Do I have to talk about this? you got a nice little long page of notes here, so I'm very curious how this is going to go. <laughs> Hey, blame the Marks for loving this thing so much. We'd never be talking about this movie. All right, so... And it had a theatrical run, so technically it plays into the rules. Okay, so there was, um... <clears throat> it got... When, when Cam was going on, it got out that, um... There were these posters that a lot of people thought were fake, but they actually weren't. Um... Like, um... What was it? There was Santa Claus, and it was like... C A C L A W S, of course. There was that movie with uh, Derek Jacoby where he's like in prison doing Shakespeare or something. <laughs> what? Um, <laughs> I've heard of any of this. There stuff. were there were a lot of those. I forget them now, but uh, one of them actually got popularity, and that was Sharknado with Tara Reid and John Hurd. <laughs> Don't forget Ian Ziering. 
don't know who the fuck that is. He he's, the star, he's the star of the movie, but I don't know who he is. He was on Beverly Hills and I two one oh. That's the only thing I know him from. <sighs> okay. Well, I'm trying to figure out what I should start with. Should I just go into why I hate it right now, or should I talk about plot? I'll start how it starts, okay. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll plot it up and then... When the movie starts, it. we're on this boat, and there's this captain, and he's with a dude, and he serves him uh, shark fin soup. Okay. And what they do is they catch sharks out of the ocean, and they cut their fins off, and they throw them back in the ocean, and I guess the fins, like, sell for a lot. Okay. They're going to sell it to this guy for, like, half a million dollars. We learned this in the code, remember? <laughs> well, here's the thing. Um, while <coughs> this is going on, a storm is kicking up. And, um... This storm turns into a tornado. <clears throat> and obviously these waters are infested with sharks. Sharks that are pissed off because they've been having their fins cut off and sold. Yeah. But apparently these sharks have other powers. They can do all kinds of shit. They're like like at the end of uh, the second piranha movie when the piranhas start fucking walking. Yeah, that was weird. Um, <laughs> anyway. That was really weird. Anyway. Um, so... There is a debacle involving this payoff, but then the storm comes in and uh, sharks come onto the boat and they start eating everybody. And I'm talking like, um, they get sucked up like they're fucking spaghetti. They don't get chomped or anything, they just like, here's the shark's mouth and here's the person just <laughs> right in there. <laughs> what? And then... Um, the the one guy with the money gets pulled in, and then the captain... The tornado comes, and the captain... It's a, Speaking of Piranha, you'll recall the beginning of the Piranha remake. The the death scene with Richard Dreyfus, mm -hmm. where he's underwater, and they're all spinning around him, and then they, he, his skin just starts to fly off from where they're eating him while he's spinning around in this little tornado. Yeah. Uh, that scene is ripped off in the death scene of the captain. It's basically the same thing, except on land. Okay. <clears throat> and then we meet our hero hero you see that's 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 the thing um everybody does their part in this movie but you have to have your one hero because nobody gives a fuck about anybody else it's all about the hero yeah it gets to have you know the kiss and save the day i shit you not his name's finn yeah i'm reading this right now because that was really clever Speaking of the writing in this movie, I just want to bring up something. This I discovered this when it was at Cannes, actually, when I, the, I first saw the poster. <clears throat> the writer's name is Thunder Levin. So I went to his IMDb page to see what he's done. But I forget what I saw because I was distracted by his biography. Do you know what his biography says? No. His biography is one sentence long. Oh, Lord. Thunder is his real name. That is the extent of his IMDb biography. <laughs> yeah, enough said. <laughs> That's the tagline of this movie, by the way. I did that on purpose. <laughs> okay, so I'll get to that bullshit in a minute. <laughs> so what happens here is Finn and his buddy Baz, I think yep, his name was. Baz. Um, they are surfing, and they have, a, and Finn also owns a bar. And in this bar, we have the... Oh, my God, I remember their names. Yeah. <laughs> God help me. The waitress's name is Nova. Yep. And John Hurd plays George. George is that guy that's at the bar every single day because he's lonely, and he sits in the same on the same stool and orders the same drinks, and he's there every day because he's lonely. He's Norm. But yes. he's... Yes. But he's not, like, beloved. <laughs> and Nova has this scar on her thigh. That she won't talk about. I wonder what happened. I would have no idea. So anyway, basically, this storm hits. Sharks start attacking people. By the way, um, we're we're like right on the shore, and there's this guy. There's a shot of this guy, um, and he's supposedly being eaten by a shark. It's like, oh my god, help me, and stuff like that. Um, he is like. There is no possible way this water could have a shark in it. He's, like, right on the shore. <laughs> it's so I tiny. I don't know. It's so tiny with its tiny teeth. 
And when they ran out of money for effects, because obviously you know how cheap this movie is, that's its whole notoriety. Yeah. Where its whole notoriety comes from. There is clearly a guy who has lost his leg, and his fucking cap is like buried in the sand to make it look like it. Oh, wow. <laughs> so anyway, they go into the bar, and we get our band of survivors. That would be Finn, Baz, Nova, and George. And they all grab a weapon. George grabs his fucking bar stool. Way to go, John Hurd. That's really going to help you out. <laughs> John Hurd doesn't make it in the first half hour. Uh, I'll, say, I'll say that now, because that really disappointed me. He's not even listed in the uh, synopsis. Okay. So, uh, yeah, what's really funny about this big carnage scene, too, do you remember the scene in Piranha? Yes. Like that wild-ass scene. They're basically trying to uh, bring back the... the flair of that. Okay. Um... My Eli Ross scene that I love so much. The Piranha remake from 2010, being a cult classic now, is what this movie is trying to cash in on. Uh, this massacre they're trying to top, there's like maybe five people on this beach because it's like they just couldn't afford that many extras. Good God. <laughs> but, you know, they, they scream and they flail around trying to make it look like... It's like the end of In the Army now when it's just the three of them firing, trying to make it look like there's 50 of them. <laughs> Regardless, um, they are watching the news, because that's what you do, and um, the only explanation for this is global warming. That's the only thing the news says could be the problem. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, they have to leave because the storm lets loose a Ferris wheel. And this Ferris wheel rolls around town crushing people. <laughs> that sounds like a movie in its own right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that should be. Uh, it's like a much more extreme version of Rubber. <laughs> I still haven't seen Rubber, but I know it's a plot. Or Deathbed, the bed that eats people. <laughs> okay, so... Um, after this Ferris wheel crushes people, it also crushes Finn's bar. That means they gotta get in a car and drive off. So he calls up his ex-wife, Tara Reed, and he says he's coming to get her. But she's, all, she's, you know, she's, she's not paying attention to anything. This massive storm is killing everybody, and Tara Reed's all, No, we'll be fine. My boyfriend says we'll be fine. And, oh, he has a daughter, too, by the way. Yep. But this, but this is something dumb. <laughs> um, apparently Nova has the most unsubtle crush anybody has ever had on anybody with Finn. Finn does not seem to notice this. Despite the fact that, um, apparently she didn't know Finn had an ex-wife or a daughter, so she gets pissed off when she finds out he has a wife. He gets even more pissed off when she finds out he has a daughter. Whatever. <laughs> um, so, you know what they're gonna try to do with this. Naturally. Mm-hmm. Yay. So anyway, they're driving to Tara Reed's house. And uh, it's an interesting concept. Obviously, the streets are flooded, so there's sharks in the fucking streets. But it's not helping anything. They're just driving through it. They don't do anything creative with it. Um, and then they stop. They get stopped at, like, this bridge, and there's a bunch of carnage going on. And this girl, this woman's dog, she's locked her dog in her car. So John Hurd comes to the rescue and breaks the UI window with his bar stool and saves the dog. But... He's not in time enough to uh, stop himself from getting eaten. Yeah, boy. Um, thus losing the only actor that had genuine credit going into this movie. <laughs> so, uh, yep, Cutter's Way, um, uh, After Hours, a cameo in In the Line of Fire, it doesn't matter. They didn't care to keep him into the movie for more than half an hour. Gone. Kevin McAllister's dad, gone. <laughs> so, um... We're just stuck with these three fuckheads now. But then they get to Tara Reed's house, and she has the stereotypical tool boyfriend, who's, you know, uh, Finn? I think you should leave that kind of guy. But then a shark breaks through the window and eats him. What? Uh, <laughs> what? And that's, that's what it takes to get Tara Reed moving. Oh she God. was not going to go anywhere until a shark busted through the window and ate this fuck. So her and the daughter, even though they're still acting pissed off at him, uh get in the car and they all drive off. Now we got a new band of survivors to not care about. That becomes shark food, of course. Yes. <laughs> well, 
there's... It makes no sense, this thing with Nova, because, um... She gets... She's acting all possessive of Finn here. Like I said, Finn does not even remotely seem to be aware of this thing at all that's happening. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's really, really bad chemistry and really, really bad acting, or... Something's just wrong with this character. I don't know. But anyway, oh, and shock surprise, the scar on her leg, her family was eaten by sharks, which makes her this vengeful badass with a shotgun shooting sharks left and right. What? So, uh, let's get to one part of the movie that made me go, holy shit. It's got nothing to do with sharks. <laughs> by the way. There's a school bus full of children. Uh, this is a very interesting cameo. I wouldn't call it a cameo. This guy probably begged for this part because I'm sure he's out of work. <laughs> but I knew who he was. And I was like, holy shit. That's insane. He's in a movie. Um, they're at this... They've got the school bus full of children that they got to save now. And, of course, there's a bus driver. The bus driver is Robbie Rist. Robbie Rist is a famous voice actor, most notable for being Michelangelo in the Ninja Turtles movies. Yeah. He's also in Iron Eagle. <laughs> um, and I was like, I was like, awesome. Is he going to be like the in part of the band of Survivors now? Because that'd be awesome. No. <laughs> nope. Um, they tried to be funny with his death, too. Um, it would be cool under any other circumstances. But it was just fucking, fucking dumb. Uh, he says, um, when they're in the bus earlier, he says, um, I moved to California to be an actor. And then the whole scene happens, and the big rescue happens, and everybody's safe. But then the tornado comes, and the, ho the Hollywood sign, the letters start to fly off. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then um, he's standing here. It's not as awesome as it sounds. It probably sounds like a good line and a good payoff, but the execution's not very good. So he's standing here and everybody's fine, and he says, My mom was told me Hollywood was going to kill me. And then he's crushed by one of the letters. It happens. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. So, um... I'm going to pretty much leave it at that. You can pretty much figure out where the rest of it goes. They go off. His, he has a son... That once again freaks out Nova. It's like, oh, you didn't tell me you had a son. I haven't even told you I have a crush on you yet, but you should tell me fucking everything. She turned into Aziz there. Yeah, she did. <laughs> um, so his son is in flight school, so they go there, and yeah, it's so not going to be important that his son is a pilot. And apparently an expert with explosives in this warehouse that just happens to have a bunch of weapons in it. Um, they all blow up the end. Uh, now let me get into what I really hate about this movie. <laughs> okay, this is what I really wanted to talk about. <sighs> this movie... I'm trying to think of an example. Um, I heard an example while I was watching this movie and now I've forgotten it. Um, what's a movie... Okay... I won't use an example because I can't remember one now, but when a movie becomes a cult favorite, generally it didn't set out to be that way. Correct. The people that made it just set out to make a movie that they thought would make a good story and a good movie. Mm. But it doesn't generally get an audience right away, but then people discover it. Okay. That's how cult movies work, usually. Um, but there is this new trend going on of wannabe cult movies Ooh. where they're setting out to make a cult movie. They know what they're making is bad, and they know they're going to people are going to take to it because it's intentionally bad, because that's a thing now. There was no sincerity in making this movie. They wanted attention. When your poster says Sharknado starring Tara Reid, and it's the tagline is enough said with an exclamation point. You clearly have an agenda making this fucking thing. True. You're not gonna say, oh, we made a small movie, hopefully people see it. You're trying to get attention. Yeah, definitely. And you're trying to get this 
And of course it fucking works. Everybody knows about this movie now. Yep. Um, it's the reason why we're, we're doing this right now. But here's the thing. This movie is not one of those so bad it's good movies. Like, it's trying so hard to be. And, like, people are going to call it. This movie is very slow. It's an hour and 25 minutes. And I, it was, I feel like I was on forever. There's no charm to it. It's not funny in a, it's not funny in, like, a charmingly bad way. It doesn't have any... Redeeming qualities? Yeah. Like I said, there's no sincerity in it either. In a real cult movie, there is some kind of sincerity from the people that made it. Yeah. This is not that. These people are just wannabe, try-hard, desperate people. They wanted to make a quick buck. Yeah. And I'm sure these guys will... I guarantee there's going to be a straight to... There's just going to be straight to video movies coming out left and right saying from the guys that made Sharknado. You know that. It's going to be like the Avatar movies. They're just going to go... Like, they're going to make Sharknado, and it's going to say from the guys that brought you Sharknado, and they're going to make another movie like, um... Hurra Shark. Yeah, I'm just throwing that out there. And then, once Hurra Shark has been made, it's going to be, um... Sharkquake. Yes. <laughs> and when Sharkquake comes out, it's going to say from the guys that made Hurra Shark. And it's, they're just going to try to make this ongoing thing over and over again that's going to attract people that buy into this so bad it's good trend. That's the thing, though. When you watch, like, Ed Wood movies, when you say a movie is so bad it's good, the reason you say it is because the movie was supposed... To... The guy that made the movie thought it was good. Ed Wood thought his movies were great. Yes, <laughs> very true. That's what makes them so bad they're good. Because you know somebody saw a genius in them somewhere. Correct. Even if it was the guy that made them. Um... There's got to be some guy living in a basement somewhere that will tell you Ed Wood is the greatest director of all time. Yeah. Somewhere somebody will say that. Probably won't be watching this video. <laughs> but this this is not what that is. No. These guys know what the fuck this is. It's a Freeburg and Seltzer movie. And then they do this... Here's... that's This is what really pisses me off about that is the fact that they actually do, towards the very end, they try to do character development. Like when she talks about, they saved this whole, the scar on her leg was from a shark attack when she was little that killed her family thing. And then they try to make her this hardcore badass. They, they start to lose themselves at the end. Like, they set out to make this movie that was going to try to cash in on the so bad it's good trend. But then in the last ten minutes, it's suddenly like they thought they were making something great. Like, they try to be all badass. Like, they play rock music while Hummers drive around, and there's chainsaws, and there's, there's this big money scene at the end where uh, Finn literally makes him... He pulls a Tommy Lee Jones in Men of Black. He intentionally gets eaten by the shark so he can break out of its stomach with a chainsaw. By the way, if you read IMDb, that fucking scene was shot in a parking lot. I swear to God. Wow. <laughs> um... So, um, yeah, and then they try to do character development when she's telling this emotional story, and then when the son's telling a story, they start to fall in love and all that, and the relationship between him and Tara Reid is rekindled, and they're trying to be serious, actually, and it's... Oh, God. No. This... Yeah. Cult movies try to set out to be unique. and something new. And that's why it takes a while for audiences to find them. These guys wanted to try to find an audience instantly by trying that. Correct. Which is just a... No. <laughs> just, uh... Just no. But no, this movie got the attention that they wanted. So, I don't know what's gonna happen. I'm sure these guys will do more like I was talking about. I'm sure there'll be a whole fucking thing of these. Hurry Shark. Yeah. Shark Quake. They also, I'm sure they also tried to... Um, they're probably, they probably took a lot of uh, from the snakes on a plane. Shark too. Ferno. <laughs> so... I just... Just... Don't. Please, don't buy into this. Come on. <laughs> Let's be, you know... Come on. 
<laughs> I'm begging you people to not buy into this bullshit. You can do what you want. I'm just, I'm just throwing a suggestion out there <laughs> to not buy into this. That's it. Fair enough. That's all. Fuck it. Fuck this movie, please. Just don't. <laughs> I'm talking to the people that want to see it, and I'm talking to the people that made it. Stop. Just don't. <laughs> Take your hand and we just slap it right on the hands over and over again. Do you get the point? You will not do that. <laughs> so, speaking of uh, sea life. Yes. Um, our last movie is a critically acclaimed documentary from Sundance called Blackfish. Correct. Uh, you seem to know a lot more about this than I did. You might want to almost commandeer this review here. I can. <clears throat> um, basically, Blackfish is the story of Tillicum. <clears throat> Tillicum is a very infamous whale who has had, let's just say, a lot of problems over the years. <laughs> there was There was that guy at the beginning that was getting all emotional. There was like... What well, started off with there were like they would like cut whales open and like fill them with rocks and then like, fill them rock and sink them in the bottom of the ocean exactly. And then once Tilikum was like in his tank, he was like basically bullied. Yeah. Like you'd you'd see like scars and marks on him from where they would like do whatever they do. Exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, basically, Tilikum got captured off of in Iceland in uh, 1983. What actually? It's worth noting the movie actually starts with um, Dawn's death. It starts with Dawn. It starts with the uh, nine one one call that that everyone heard with, about it, Dawn's official death. It sets it up. They tell you the details of what happened to Dawn, and it makes you think, like, "Good God, this thing's a monster! Somebody kill it!" Yeah. But then they say, "Well, here's there's the reason a, there's why. probably a reason that happened." <laughs> yeah, I mean. Telecom is, uh, he spent a long time in different places before he ended up at SeaWorld Orlando, where he's still there to this day. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I actually have pictures of Telecom from uh, last December's trip, to be totally honest. I picture him. <laughs> I picture you with this picture from a distance, and it's this whale in like an orange jumpsuit. <laughs> <laughs> Telecom basically doesn't do really shows anymore. He just comes out for the big splash at the very end of all the the Shamu show. The uh, I, I feel bad for making that jumpsuit joke because the things that happen to people in this movie are horrible. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and it shows basically what happens when you don't properly train your staff. <laughs> and that works in every single way, especially when you're working with wild animals. Well, I took down some of the things that happened to some people. There was... um. There was that one girl who was... Well, actually, there was one where um, the guy actually got footage of a woman being pulled in. Yes. And they, like, made him destroy it. Like, they would not let that footage be seen ever. <laughs> yeah, he actually worked... He was shooting video for uh, the show, and all of a sudden, this happened, and they're like, we can't use this anymore. It's like, well, let's clip it. No, no, we can't use this anymore. Just get rid of it now. It's like the Brandon Lee footage from the Crow. <laughs> exactly. Let's just push it under the rug. It never <clears throat> existed. And there we get that girl that was, um... The teenage girl? The girl that was just kind of sitting on the edge. Yeah. And then she just kind of got pulled in. and It kind of took people a while to react because they thought maybe that was just what she was doing. Correct. And then she's, like, fighting her way out, and then she finally comes out, and her she her arm is, like... Yeah, it's, like, hanging shit. from the bone, and it's, like, <laughs> bent to the side. And then there's the guy <clears throat> who actually was doing... Was riding on the, uh, the whale, and the other whale <clears throat> literally came up and just crushed him. <laughs> so, yeah... It's, I mean, it's does not pain. It does really does not paint a really uh, flattering really. picture in, of SeaWorld's light. There was a really good segment with um, the guy that was actually the guy that actually ended up more or less okay. Yeah, he just had a foot injury, but the guy that um, his him is Ken something. Mm -hmm. Um, he kept getting pulled under for very long periods of time, but he was like. He knew exactly how to handle. Like he was really patient, and he knew how long to hold his breath. And he was a scuba diver, so he uh, he had the uh, patience in order and the training in order to be able to do it. And he more or less just kind of waited it out and was able to finally get away. And he actually calmed he calmed the whale down too. <clears throat> so it's like he's like, he he basically he had a foot injury from where he was pulled, but more or less um, he came out the best of the other people that had run-ins. There was um, the Spanish guy. Yeah, the guy at the uh, the Marine Park in uh, 
the other country, I believe. I don't remember what it is on top of my head. Yeah. Mexico, they, maybe? <clears throat> no, it can't be Mexico. It's basically... Um, Bra- Brazil, Spain. I, we get, we get those really good... Um, we get those really good moments of... Um, obviously, cameras aren't allowed in courtrooms. Correct. So... Um, oh, I love this. This is awesome. The animated setups with, like, the script going over them. Yeah. And they said... Um, they were talking... After the uh, Spanish guy was killed, and basically this... I guess we're supposed to assume it was like a SeaWorld ripoff. Yeah. But um, by the way they react, I think we're supposed to assume they probably had some kind of tie in with SeaWorld because the um, of the sinister way the uh, they revealed the representative it. of SeaWorld denied it up and down <laughs> that they had anything to do with it. <clears throat> Very true. And it's just like so you paint out. Dawn, the way she is, she's the main <clears throat> the main focus is, of all the stuff that happened with Silicon. The main focus of the movie, other than <clears throat> the whale itself, is is Dawn. And the fact that she was so loved by her co-workers, and she was the senior trainer. And it was kind of like, this, <clears throat> this she's the last person this would ever happen to. And of course, SeaWorld threw her under the bus and said it was her ponytail, and there's like, a lot of conjecture, pretty much, a lot of... He said, she said, stuff just not adding up. It's really hard to watch um, the fury and the sadness in people. Um, oh, my God. The people I that know. knew her trying to talk about the fact that SeaWorld actually tried to blame her. <laughs> SeaWorld blamed her for it. <clears throat> and, of course, you know, we get the uh, the inevitable text at the end that says, uh, SeaWorld declined many times to be interviewed for this movie. <laughs> Okay, I'll say this right now. Okay, we'll go back. This is kind of funny. We'll go back to the early 90s. We'll go back to Free Willy. And I'll do that. I, I told you the story. I'll, I'll tell it on, on air here. Um, I really like Free Willy. And I was a big, uh, big SeaWorld supporter. <clears throat> uh, SeaWorld used to be outside of Cleveland in a little suburban town called Aurora. So, yeah, that's what I think comes to mind when I hear Aurora. Um, basically, and uh, obviously, uh, Sleeping Beauty. But the thing is... I used to go there all the time. My dad used to work for Anheuser-Busch, and I used to get, like, tickets for SeaWorld and Busch Gardens all the time, so I was a big SeaWorld fan. And I took a long time of going, I uh, took a long time off of going, and I was a big fan of whales and dolphins, and I love whales and everything. And I watched this movie, and I <clears> love <throat> SeaWorld, I do. I mean, I, there's some really awesome roller coasters there, I love the shows there, but the thing is, when it all comes down to it, I mean, this paints SeaWorld out to be the bad guy, big time. Like, in this, I was watching this movie, I was like, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do about trying to enter this park again, because I feel like a hypocrite, like crazy for doing that. Because it was such a powerful documentary. It's like watching The Cove. I mean, it's such a powerful documentary. It's just like... It doesn't help at all that, um... It hits home. We see that, I can't remember what exactly her title was, but she was basically the woman representing SeaWorld in court. Correct. And she would come out of these court hearings smiling. Yeah, I know. That was, that was a little unsettling. <laughs> and apparently, uh, I'm actually reading on Los Angeles Times website right now, that says that the uh, documentary itself is hurting the attendance of SeaWorld right now. So that's why it's really interesting, because SeaWorld actually just I- issued something for the rest of the year, uh, $50 tickets. One day, like, you go in for one day for 50 bucks, and they're also like... There's passes where you can get a fun card, which you can pay for one day, and you get the entire year for free. It's basically getting to um, when you see those um, everything must go sales. Yeah. Where it's like this item was a dollar, now it's fifty cents, and you see fifty cents marked out, and it's like now it's ten cents. <laughs> and SeaWorld also at one point last year was trying to be an IPO. <clears throat> they were trying to become an IPO and everything, and there all this hit around <clears throat> this time, and it was kind of like. Yeah, we might want to change our mind. And they almost sold, I mean, they almost sold the company. Obviously, it went from Anheuser-Busch to InBev, and InBev ended up buying the Busch Gardens parks as well. So SeaWorld looked like it was going to be on the uh, on the chopping block for a while, like it was actually going to be sold to the highest bidder. And there was actually rumors that they were going to go to Disney or Universal to buy SeaWorld, which would have been awesome. And I talked about it actually in a plus or minus. But um, the thing about it is, is that this was a bad time for SeaWorld, and this was really, really bad publicity in the total way possible. The Dime with Shamu show that they actually, where this happened, the Dime with Shamu show was completely eliminated, and it just got brought back. It took about two and a half years for it to get it brought back. And they actually have this like plexiglass floor in the <clears throat> bottom of the pool now that raises and lowers, so you can't have this happen again. And you're not allowed to see, you're never going to see that iconic... Your trainer is swimming with the whale 
and all of a sudden he dives off the top of the, the whale's nose and everything that shot that's in every single SeaWorld promotional video from <clears throat> the beginning of SeaWorld's inception. They, they show those. And exactly, and it's showed in the movie <clears throat> as well. You and can see they're on like somebody's old recorded VHS yeah, tape. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I have some of those actually still to this day in VHS tapes that are somewhere buried in a closet somewhere. But basically what it boils down to is this really paints out SeaWorld to be the bad guy. And the problem is, if you don't defend yourself, then you really look guilty. Like, I defend myself all the time for indiscretions that are complete, total lies, but that's because I know I'm not guilty. SeaWorld does not defend themselves, and they still put the blame on Don to this day. So you got to think what kind of wonders that the SeaWorld PR department are uh, spinning right now. So, yeah, it's really, it's, it's intense. It's an intense documentary. <clears throat> I do know a little bit about the the story. It does. So. It does have an, regardless of uh, what it involves, uh, it does have an optimistic ending at least. Very much so. <clears throat> so uh, there's that. <laughs> and basically, and Tilikum was used at, for breeding, pretty much. So they showed like they showed a level of like different people, like the different whales that have been breeded because of Tilikum, and it goes down. So all this DNA from this so-called evil whale is just like wafting through <clears throat> everyone at different parks now. So it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, I, I like SeaWorld. I do. I love the parks. I love the coasters. I just wish that... I think SeaWorld is... See, the thing is, you see don't see SeaWorld's side of this. You get like... You don't get any a spin or anything like that. I wish I would see SeaWorld's version of this story. Like, I mean, legitimate version of this story, not like... Like, we're going to slap you on the wrist version of the story. Like, okay, you just say this, say this, say this. And you have, like, 16 yes-men behind you telling you what to say. No, I think what I want to hear is the legitimate story from someone that's willing to tell it. And I think a lot of people in Blackfish are willing to tell the legitimate story. But I still think there's a couple things that we still don't know to this day. And we're never going to know. But that's the way it is with documentaries. You want me to commandeer the uh, review? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't have anything else to say. <laughs> what else did you write down um, in your notes? Just the people that I wanted to bring up. All right. <clears throat> uh, the victims, I guess you could say. And uh, oh yeah, this is another thing too. This was a big uh, information. Information. Wow, I don't know what word I'm looking for. This was a big deal that was found out uh, recently. <clears throat> uh, John Lasseter and Andrew uh, Stanton are getting ready to do Finding Dory. Yeah. And <clears throat> Finding Dory's story is basically. Blackfish. How's they're that? going into a marine park and they're going to do, they're doing, they're doing, it's not the same thing, but I mean, they're playing it off like a, like a SeaWorld ripoff and everything like that. That's where Dory and Nemo and everyone, and Marla and everyone end up. So, <clears throat> they went to the director, which is Gabriella Cowperthwaite, and they uh, basically changed the entire story after seeing Blackfish. Because they don't want to be, uh, they don't want to do that to the movie, not at all. It's uh, the depiction of the Marine Park that was included in the movie. So it completely changed how Finding Dory is going to be. So That was interesting. I found that out and I was like, this is very strange they would go that direction. But There's always that. I think we're done here. Sweet. <laughs> Next week, I don't know and neither Rid do you. Riddick, Riddick is the only thing we know else. about. <laughs> Uh, uh, hopefully we're going to be uh, making another trek uh, 45 minutes away to Athens in the near future to watch things but right now we don't have anything so hopefully uh, things will come out uh, a lot of stuff on the channel this week we've got a uh, brand new verses coming out on Sunday your uh, cryptic comment is bars so we'll go with that and uh, we've got something uh, special for you guys on Saturday's video we're actually going to be talking about our uh, Oscar prediction for the big six for uh, August we do this every month so that's going to be starting tomorrow. So there we go. Hey, Jay, you have anything to uh, add before we uh, go home? No. Right on. Enough said. Oh, fuck.